Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's Wu Yu event with Dr. Mark Dunbar. His presentation is titled Advances in Understanding Geogra Geographic Atrophy. So I'll be your host tonight. My name is Dr. Ariel Sorenzi. So it's my honor to introduce our speaker for tonight. He has been uh, working with Baskin Palmer now for, he said, over 35 years, right? Or 35 Correct. years? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good so year. as you can imagine, he sees all kinds of crazy cases. Um, and we've had him on WooU before to speak on macular degeneration, and we couldn't get enough of him. So we had him come back for more. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Here are his financial disclosures, all of which have been mitigated. So I'll have you take it from here, Dr. Dunbar. Thank you, Ariel. Appreciate it. Um, this Wu University always impresses me. You know, we've got almost 700 people that are listening in and watching. And to me, uh, that's really uh, impressive. So thank you all for taking the time out. Um, I would love to think that it was because of me, but I know it's just more a matter of uh, getting an hour of continuing education. So, um, but anyhow, that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about some of the advances in the understanding of geographic atrophy. Um, you know, who would have thought that we would be spending a whole hour talking about geographic atrophy it was usually in an amd discussion or an amd talk it was really almost an af afterthought um end stage of dry amd um not a lot we could do and and you would glance over it and and it really is amazing how this has changed um and i would tell you 2023 is no doubt has been the year of macular degeneration particularly the year of, of geographic atrophy, right? So you go back almost exactly a year on February 17th, the FDA approves the first uh, treatment for geographic atrophy. At the time, the first and only treatment for geographic atrophy, which of course is a, a leading cause of blindness uh, or at least legal blindness. Um, and it was not without controversy. And that's uh, one of the interesting things that make this topic so interesting because it is not a cure. Um, these treatments really just slow the disease down. Um, and, and there's so much that we're learning about them. And, and of course, our questions from being in the trenches, right? The primary eye care provider uh, is, is really recognizing geographic atrophy. It's more common than we ever thought. <laughs> Excuse me. And then, you know, getting them into the retinal specialist and then really kind of talking about the treatments and the burden of treatment. So, so February 2023, really the first FDA-approved treatment, followed almost six months later in August by Iserve, Avicenna Pegol, which was the second FDA-approved treatment for geographic atrophy. So not just one, but at least two treatments for GA. And so, you know, we conjure in our mind, right, this is maybe the, the poster child of, of what we think about with geographic atrophy. This was a patient that presented some years ago, and, and it's really an all too familiar picture, right? We've all seen a patient like this. Uh, they still have reasonably good acuity. You can see 2040 in the right eye, 2060 in the left eye. And in years past, we would we would look at this patient um, and and there was this <laughs> almost impotent feeling as, as an eye care provider, right? Because there's not really much we could offer this patient. There was no treatment. Of course, we would talk about low vision and, and optimizing the vision that they have, but but the fact is, um, we would watch this patient, you know, slowly lose vision over time, and there was really nothing we could do, and it was really hard for them to really understand. Um, and and it was sad. There was, I think, desperation on our part, certainly desperation on the patient's part. Um, and so when we finally finally have not one but two treatments. For, for geographic atrophy. I think if nothing else, it offers hope, you know, gives us something to offer patients. And even though, as I said, these treatments aren't a cure, they're, they're not optimal, they, they do something, they slow the disease down. And the hope is that they slow the disease down enough to really allow these patients to, to have decent vision for the remainder of their life. That's, you know, whether it's reading a newspaper, recognizing a, a grandchild, being active, productive members of, of society. And, and we know that when patients start losing vision, especially central vision, it's 
um, again, it's a, it, it's a loss of independence. And we see these patients, you know, again, too often. So, so that's what it is. So no question, geographic atrophy has been a very, very hot topic. And we'll kind of dig into uh, kind of the nuts and bolts and really what are their treatments about? What are the type of patients we need to be referring? And then uh, hopefully if you have questions, we can answer them. And so obviously we know, right? This is the minutia of the stuff that we already know about macular degeneration. It is a degenerative disorder that affects the macula. It is, or at least was, I'm not sure in the era of anti-VEGF, it's still considered the, le the leading cause of, of legal blindness in people over the age of 65. Certainly it's common enough, uh, whether it's one or two, it's certainly significant. Most of those patients who lose vision, uh, we know that they lose it because of coronal vascular membrane, the wet form of the disease. And uh, and this is a, an example, right? The patient who's got drusenoid change, they present with subretinal hemorrhage. And that's a patient that we immediately recognize as having wet macular degeneration. So, uh, you know, the good news when I talk to patients about AMD, right, is in, in, in most of these patients, when we see them, they will have the dry form. And you tell them, right? I, I try to be encouraging. 90% of people have the dry form. And most people it does not affect visual acuity in any significant way. So being able to read, drive, uh, enjoy a good quality of life, the majority of people, that's really the case, right? It's only 10% that go on to develop the wet form of the disease on about 10 to 20% of these dry AMD patients will go on to de develop geographic atrophy. So, you know, you try to paint uh, a, a, a brighter picture uh, because you know, let's face it, most of these patients in that elderly population know somebody who's had macular degeneration. They've been around somebody who's had intravitreal injection. So there is a little bit of doom and gloom that, that goes with this diagnosis. There's anxiety, these worries and concerns. And so, you know, for the most part, my goal is really to offer encouragement. Just because you've got AMD, remember, most people will have the dry form. Most people, it does not progress. And that's why you know, you're sitting in our chair. We're going to watch you. We're going to do imaging. We're going to follow you. We'll make the appropriate recommendations. And so risk factors, of course, we know aging is the number one risk factor. And obviously race, uh, the typical white Anglo-European descent is really the, the, the main people who get it. Certainly we see it in the Hispanic population. We also see it in the Asian population. Interestingly, we do not see it so much in the African-American or Black population. But in the era of mixed races, certainly you can see it. Uh, and we know that genetics, as we've talked about with race and so on, is really a big factor in this disease. We'll talk about really the role of complement factor H and other genes in really leading to the development of macular degeneration. Um, and so the fact is, I think you recognize, right, we're, we're, we've got an aging population, right? We've got uh, about 10,000 people a day in this country turn 65. We know that patients are living longer. Uh, there's better health care uh, and, and obviously better quality of life. So it's not uncommon to see the patient who's living into the 80s and 90s. And that's really where we typically see uh, macular degeneration and in particular geographic atrophy. So you look 2020, right? Late AMD, late AMD affects about 11 million. By 2040, that number is going to be about 18 million. You look in particular at geographic atrophy, that accounts for about 35%. Uh, of late macular degeneration and about 20% of legal blindness is, is attributable in AMD to geographic atrophy. And again, this is borne out in, in all these population-based studies that have been done over the years, and you can kind of see those there on the right. And so, of course, the question is, why do some people get it and other people don't? So we've kind of alluded to this, right, genetic background, and we'll dive into that a little bit. Those who have complement factor H, maybe the ARMS2 genes, those are two of the key genes that lead to the development of macular degeneration. We know that environmental and lifestyle factors play a role like diet, like smoking, like oxidative stress. And it's really that interaction between these variables that predispose patients to go on to develop macular de de degeneration. Um, of course, we know that we've had great treatments. Well, I don't want to call an intravitreal injection every single month a great treatment, but you know, when you look at what the alternative was in the 80s and 90s of laser photocoagulation, um, you know, relatively speaking, these were pretty darn good treatments, and certainly they were hugely successful. Hopefully on another time, we can talk about that. And again, the focus of tonight is really giving me the treatments for geographic atrophy. And so again, from a clinical perspective, right, we look at patients every day, we typically dilate them, we pick up our 90, we're 78, 
whatever lens you're used to looking at it, of course, when we look at the macula, one of the kind of hallmark features of macular degeneration are these drusenoid changes that we see. And so they are extracellular deposits below the retinal pigment epithelium. They comprise lipid and protein-rich debris. So it is the result of an abnormal byproduct of metabolic activity, uh, in part because of some of the things we've talked about. When we look histopathologically, about 40% of drusen contain lipid. And then you see some of these other components like lipofusin, albumin, and a few other things. Note that you will also see when these drusen have been looked histopathologically, some of the end products of this complement cascade, which we'll dive into, C1, C3, C5. And, um, and we'll talk about the significance, but one of the kind of the, 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 the big questions, right, is the complement cascade one of the mediators of macular degeneration? And, and we know that that's the case in part because when we look at these drusen, we see some of these end products of this complement factor, uh, this complement cascade. We'll kind of dive into that a little bit. You know, any more macular degeneration has really become almost like diabetic retinopathy. Uh, anytime you see an AMD, I think you need to start thinking about staging or categorizing macular degeneration. You look at the left, not the best slide, you can see a few of these drusen or druplets, and that would uh, categorically be considered early macular degeneration. When you kind of do your ICD encoding, you would code it as early AMD. That middle slide, they're intermediate. We'll talk about kind of how you kind of make that differentiation between early and intermediate AMD. But again, you see in the slide, there's more RPE modeling, there's more drusen, even looking at the size of the drusen. If any of those drusen are about the size of one of the branches of one of the central retinal veins, categorically, that puts a patient at an intermediate level AMD. And we'll talk about why that's significant in a little bit. And then you look at the slides on the right, right? You look at the bottom, the typical wet AMD, and then the top is the classic geographic atrophy. And that's really kind of the poster child, if you will. When we think about GA in our mind, that's really kind of the image that most of us think about. And maybe uh, that's maybe not the best way to think about GA. And again, we'll talk about why in just a second. So again, that classification is based on this Beckman Committee classification that classifies AMD into four stages really the focus that I want you to think about is really that intermediate level AMD. And that's, again, one large drusen that's at least 125 microns. So again, the size of one of the branches of the central retinal vein or any AMD RPE abnormalities, categorically that puts a patient at an intermediate. Anything less than that, and again, smaller drusen that becomes early AMD. And again, that really puts patients in a different category. Um, and, and, and again, we'll kind of get into it here in just a second. Again, we know that in advanced AMD, there's two forms, geographic atrophy and neovascular AMD. And, and here's a couple examples of, of, you know, what you would, might consider intermediate AMD. The one on the left, of course, I think we all would agree with that. These coalesced drusen, you can see the RP abnormalities. The middle slide, maybe a few larger drusen, a couple of those or two or three of those, certainly the size of one of the branches of the central retinal vein. Uh, and then the one on the right, there's there's more drusen. Arguably, you know, you could say, well, gosh, is it early or is it intermediate? And 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 you know, we don't want to split hairs. It's it's you know whether you called it early and it's intermediate. I think you would recognize the potential of this disease progression. You know, the the two middle ones I might see in six months. The one on the right, I'd probably see in nine months to a year. We think about when is the best time to initiate imaging. And again, we'll kind of get into that. And here's the classic example. I always kind of show the slides on, on why imaging an OCT is important, right? Can you imagine looking at this patient without having an OCT, trying to answer the question, is there fluid? Is there choroidal neovascular membrane? And again, rel relying on your ability to three-dimensional recognize this there's fluid or elevation. And, and the fact is, in the era of OCT, that uh, question becomes really pretty easy to answer. And so again, you kind of look at, this is from uh, ARIDS data, you look at the bottom, right, from intermediate AMD to going on to develop either advanced uh, dry AMD or wet AMD, you look at the numbers, right? Probably wouldn't be a surprise the 10-year risk of progression to, to choroidal neovascular membrane being just under 50%, 47.6. Again, this is according to the ARID study. And so, again, I'd probably bet nobody would be surprised at that. Uh, but you look at the top one, right, 10-year risk of progression to, to geographic atrophy being over 50%. In fact, According to ARIDS, higher than 
what we would have saw with wet macular degeneration. And I will tell you, um, you know, when I first saw that statistic, I'm like, there's no way. I mean, that's just not true. Um, and I would have uh, chalked that up to probably marketing, right? Now that we have uh, treatments, we've got the marketing teams that are kind of getting us to believe that geographic atrophy is probably more common than what it is because there's no way that it's more common than than what? We just don't really see it. And, and the problem is, you know, in the form that that slide shows, right? The large discoform scar, that's, that is probably our perceptions would be true. It is not that common. Um, the fact is, Typical GA starts smaller, it starts, it starts outside the fovea. And, and, and again, in the ARID study followed over 10 years, any evidence of geographic atrophy really kind of constituted that almost 54%. We'll again talk about that in just a few seconds. But again, that intermediate level, remember that's the patient that you're going to start uh, doing imaging, OCT, if you have fundus autofluorescence. It's the intermediate level AMD that you're going to uh, talk about doing in an ARIDS formulation. Again, that intermediate level becomes kind of the, the red flag of really, I think, becoming a little more, I hate to use the term, aggressive in how you follow them. Seeing them more than once a year, usually twice a year, recommending imaging, recommending ARIDS supplements. Again, you look at risk of going on to progression moderately high compared to the early level AMD where probability of progression most patients do not progress. And so that's why intermediate level becomes such a critical stage. And so again, just very classic picture of geographic atrophy. It's the advanced or late form. It represents atrophy, the RPE photoreceptors and, uh, and, and Brooks membrane. And so the question is, you know, if you believe the 54%, is it more common than we realize? And, and I would contend that it absolutely is. And the problem is we really haven't been looking for it, right? Here's a classic example of a patient who we immediately recognize as having AMD. You see a lot of these hard and soft coalesced drusen. Um, and, and if you look at the fundus autofluorescence on the bottom, you see that there's a couple hypofluorescence areas that represents geographic atrophy. And so, you know, in this patient who's got certainly intermediate, at least level AMD, our focus has really been really watching them to make sure or seeing if they progress from dry to wet A and D. We really have not been looking for, you know, the wet, the, the geographic atrophy form of the disease. And, and really here's a classic example, right? Of a patient who's got a lot going on. And yet when you look at it, indeed, this patient has a couple patches of geographic atrophy. Now, this is maybe not a patient that we would refer, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit, but but again, just recognizing the fact that this patient has geographic atrophy. And so often starts extrafoveal, it's small, unless you're looking for it, the likelihood is you're not really going to look, you're not going to really recognize it. And so again, you know, the, the, the typical patient that you see it in, you know, you look at AMD in particular, I think we know the demographics. The fact is when you look at wet AMD, it's in that kind of 65 to 75 or 85 year old group. Whereas you look at geographic atrophy, most of these patients are gonna be over that 85 to 90 year old age group. And again, we just talked about patients living longer. Uh, this is really the patient you wanna look for. And again, just because they got GA, remember they can also develop wet AMD, we still see that. But, but again, think about that demographic in terms of offering a treatment, which uh, if you're not aware, obviously is an intravitreal injection. And so, uh, there's a whole nother side of this in terms of how do you manage that treatment burden in a group of elderly patients that are going to require frequent injections, require transportation and other things that, that you know, we're all familiar with AMD. And so I think one of the other truisms, truisms that I want you to think about tonight as well is, you know, geographic atrophy typically is slow and we think of it as a slow disease. But the fact is, it's not that slow. Um, pretty much every study uh, and, and here's an example of one that was done a few years ago. The average time of progression to develop central geographic atrophy was about two and a half years. And to go on to develop bilateral geographic, geographic atrophy is about seven years. So 2.5, I think, becomes kind of an important number. So when you see that patient with GA, and again, not that everybody's going to look like this slide, but think about the time from diagnosis to becoming central involvement on average is about two and a half years. Here's another study that was done on the United Kingdom, 10 clinical sites done over a 16 year period, looking at medical records uh, of really a number of patients. And again, on average, patients lost six to 10 letters over a two year period. And on average, 
patients that in the beginning when they were diagnosed with geographic atrophy were able to drive uh, really living relatively independent lives within two years, two thirds of them lost the ability to drive, lost their driver's license. One fifth of them became eligible for, for uh, legal blind services. So again, that idea that two and a half years or so is really the time frame from diagnosis to many of these, again, not all of them are gonna prog progress, but many of them that will, uh, will develop central involvement. And so we talked about really some of the mediating factors like genetics. Uh, we've learned from the Human Genome Project, we have a really good understanding of what are the genes that drive this disease. And, and by now you're familiar with complement factor H being one of the key drivers. ARMS2, which is really part of that uh, oxygen metabolism being another key driver. And it is believed that this complement pathway is really accounts for about 40 to 60% of, of AMD heritability. And again, we've talked about some of the components of this complement pathway being found in some of these drusen that we see every day in our clinical patients. So again, briefly, I don't want to get too much into the complement cascade, but you know, suffice it to say it's it's part of our body's primitive immune system. Anytime you get a cold like I do, I've got kept getting over a little bit of a cold, so a little congested, you get a cut on your hand, your anytime your immune system gets activated, really part of that complicate complement cascade is really part of that pathway. So it's our first line defense of the immune system. It protects from microorganisms. Um, and it's activated through a number of different processes. The classical pathway is through really an antigen antibody complex pathway. There's a lectin pathway and then an alternative pathway. And once this complement cascade gets activated, you see varying cleavage points, right? Once it gets activated, you see three feet, C3 cleaves to, to C5. C5 goes into membrane attack. There's certain, you know, sub sub uh, sub uh, stations of, uh, of this complement pathway. Uh, the end result, of course, is is membrane attack complex. So think of this almost like a stick of dynamite. You light it, the fuse goes off, and remember, the body's immune system wants to get rid of foreign invaders, wants to get rid of inflammation, and so that is what membrane attack complex does. Is it's like the stick of dynamite that blows up, and and unfortunately, when that happens. You know, there's some collateral damage. So we see that in, in AMD with RPE modeling, we see damage to the RPE. This is really kind of collateral damage of membrane attack complex. So it's so it is believed that dysregulation, unregulation of this complement pathway in part leads to the development of macular degeneration. And of course, you see there's inflammation, there's a number of byproducts as we've talked about. So the idea from a big pharma perspective is if we know that the complement system is really one of the governing bodies that leads to the development of, of AMD and thus leading to the development of geographic atrophy. If we can slow or better regulate this complement cascade, perhaps we can slow or stop the development of macular degeneration. Again, here's another way of looking at once this complement pathway gets activated, again, you see C3 cleaves into C5. There is this amplification route, C3. Uh, C3 leading to C5, C5 ultimately leading to membrane attack complex. And so again, kind of a complement slide here, but again, this is big pharma, right? Uh, the Apalis drug, uh, Cyfovery, is a C3 inhibitor. Uh, the one by uh, Iveric is absent of Captain Pegall, is a C5 inhibitor. inhibitor. Uh, so the idea, if we can inhibit this pathway, we can prevent the development of membrane attack complex. And, and again, that's easier said than one, right? There's lampalizumab was a drug by Genentech. It was a factor D inhibitor. There's a number of other medications, occlusumab. There's there's other, you know, there's other pharma companies that, that have really tried. And the fact is many of them have failed until you kind of where we are today with uh, uh, Avacitacaptid Pegol, the Ivera drug, and Pegcitic Copeland, the Apelis drug. Uh, and so we'll kind of dive into Cyfobri, right? It is a C3 inhibitor. The idea that if we stop it or slow it down, we can really prevent some of the end products of this complement pathway. And so uh, again, some of the early phase two trials. Um, again, the early trials, you looked at a group that was treated every month. Again, this was an intravitreal injection versus every other month, every month versus every other month, followed for a year. And 
And the idea, remember, this wasn't a cure. It was, can we stop or slow the progression of geographic atrophy? And at a year compared to the sham group, we saw a 29% slower rate of geographic atrophy in the every month versus only a 20% in the every other month. And that really led to really the phase three clinical trials. And so this was a double mask, randomized. You had one group that was every month. You had one group that was every other month. Uh, and these patients were ultimately followed for 24 months. And then there was a three-year extension study. And again, I don't, don't want to kind of get into the minutiae here, but this was the, the 12 to 18-month results that ultimately led uh, to FDA approval. And so, again, two parallel studies. As you know, that is what the FDA requires. And when you look at the OAK study, a 22% reduction in the growth rate of geographic atrophy compared to the placebo. The OAK study was able to meet their primary endpoint. The Derby study did not. There was only a 13% reduction. And so that was really kind of the controversy, right? So when this drug became FDA approved, these patients required either every month or every other month and only receiving uh, a 20 or 22% reduction, I'll tell you, retinal specialists were not too enthused. Um, and so, you know, part of it, yes, it's better than nothing, but gosh, do I want to do it every month? or every other month for a treatment that just basically slows it down, but not a lot. And, and ultimately what we found was if you could get them past that 12 to 18 months and what you really started to see happen was that 18 to 24 months, you almost get an acceleration in the treatment effect. And so by that 18 to 24 months, you looked at a 30% reduction uh, in, in, in the every month versus only a 24% reduction in the every other month. So again, you kind of look at big picture, right? This was kind of the controversy, right? It takes a while for this treatment to have an effect, but once it does, you start to see really a broadening of this delta. And so maybe by month 36 or three years, you really start to see really more of a treatment effect. And so, of course, the problem is, right, you're looking at that 85 to 90, 95-year-old patient who's going to come in, whether it's every month or every other month. We're going to have to treat them for a while to really begin to really see more of a therapeutic advantage. And so, again, this was kind of a projection. This was a slide that I made. And then this past month or this November 2023 at the American Academy of Ophthalmology, they presented their uh, three-year extension study. And indeed, that's what they found. And, and what they found is especially with these non sophobia so these eyes that have better vision, lesions outside of the center of the phobia. In fact, they did much better, a 45% reduction in the rate of growth of geographic atrophy compared to uh, uh, the sham group. And so, again, this was really looking at non-foveal and subfoveal, but ultimately, I think when you're looking at these eyes, and, and these are, again, this is optometry's role, right? Identifying, recognizing these patients who still have good vision, maybe even excellent vision that maybe have a potential of, 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 you know, threatening vision of getting them into the retinal specialist. And those are the ones that, you know, if we can get them in while they're still seeing well, that would be, I think, ultimately the goal. And which is why, quite frankly, we look at grants from Apellis and Iberic, because they know that these patients are sitting in our chairs. We are uh, the primary care provider. Most of these patients that are in our offices, and we are the ones who's going to diagnose it and recognize it. So again, just kind of really kind of almost what we saw and recognized. And so, I think a couple of takeaway points, right? The, the primary endpoint was, was not visual, right? They, this was not a study to see, you know, who did better if we can prevent vision loss. In fact, 60% of these patients in the study actually had subfoveal lesions and were already suffering vision loss. This was a study really looking at, does treatment slow the growth rate of geographic atrophy compared to just the natural history? And I think we, we learned the answer to that question. So again, GA is not getting better. We're just slowing the, the, the disease down with the hope that we can really slow it down enough so these patients can live their life and still enjoy good vision. So, you know, the question for, you know, among you and I and the retinal specialist, is that treatment effect good enough? Well, let's kind of add to the controversy, right? So remember this drug became FDA approved in July, excuse me, in February, uh, fast forward to July, all of a sudden at the American Society of Retinal Specialists meeting, there were six cases reported among retinal specialists of occlusive retinal vasculitis linked to this injection. Um, and so as it turned out, 
Uh, an initial email went to the ARS describing these six cases. I think to date we now have eight cases developed between seven and 13 days after the initial injection. And so quite honestly, this, this became really a hot topic. In fact, it, it spooked retinal specialists. So remember, you got a treatment that takes two or three years to work. And now if we're looking at potential risk of severe intraocular inflammation, uh, it, it really uh, became a, a kind of a hot topic. And as I said, it you know, retinal specialists were spooked. They kind of held off. Uh, and, and kind of as you go forward and you look at it, that risk is still, you know, almost less than what the risk of, an, of endophthalmitis. And, and again, there was, as they kind of looked more carefully, what they found was that it may had to do with the type of syringe. And there's a little filter on these, on the end of the needles. And, and what they were able to maybe pinpoint is it was maybe related to that. And, and, and that has since changed. So again, you're looking at an extremely low uh, risk of inflammation. Um, but again, that was really kind of part of the, the journey of last year once this drug became FDA approved. And so we kind of fast forward to, to, to the Iveric drug. Uh, and instead of being a C3 inhibitor, it was a C5 inhibitor. And so really the same idea, if we inhibit C5, can we, again, modulate, slow this overaction of the complement pathway? And will that really lead to better visual outcomes when it comes to geographic atrophy? So again, whether you're kind of inhibiting or slowing C3 or C5, really part of that, right, is, is, is really controlling inflammation and controlling development of membrane attack complex. So this was a, a, this was a uniquely different study from the Apella study. So GA in these patients had to be within 1,500 microns, but not involving the center of the fovea. So in the Apella study, when 60% were actually subfovial, this was a study really looking at patients who already had pretty good vision. So included, right? The extra foveal lesions, but within 1,500 microns. And you look at a couple examples of the kind of patients that we would look for. Patients that were excluded, subfoveal lesions, as you're seeing here, or patients who had lesions that were well outside of that 1,500 microns that really were not viewed as being a threat. And so much like the other study, there was a gather one, there was a gather two. It's important to note that at least in gather one and gather two, there was no every other arm. There was only a every month arm in gather two. In beginning year two, they, they actually did in every other arm. So this is kind of looking at the gather two study, patients having an every single month ejection. When you look at year two, again, this is only the second study, the gather two. They did have an every other arm every other month arm. And so interestingly, gather one, at least that 12 month data seemed to be better than what we saw with the Apella study. The gather two, maybe about the same. Remember, this is every month versus, again, there was not an every other month, but this is every, every month injection. Again, a 35% uh, uh, really reduction in the, in, in the growth rate of geographic atrophy. And so again, you look at the proportion of, of patients going on to lose vision, you know, much like we saw before, right? Every month, you don't really see much a change in this delta. Beginning by eight month, month eight, you can kind of start to see a separation, right? So this is the sham group. This is the eyes that had the, uh, the absent impacted Kebal, Kebal, eyes are available, let's just say that, right? And, and, and that really, you know, the hope is it's going to, that delta is going to extend out as time goes on. And again, you're looking at the percentage of people losing over 20 letters, not quite as many, um, but again, clearly an advantage. Again, this is looking at uh, 10 letters of vision. So this is kind of an important slide. Your, your, your risk reduction eyes that were not treated were more likely to lose at least 15 letters over the course of that two years compared to eyes that were not treated. Now, interestingly, at 24 months, that difference went away. But at least for the first 12 months, the patients that were not treated, more of them went on to develop at least uh, 15 letters, that's about two to three lines loss of visual acuity compared to the treated eyes. And again, we kind of alluded to the GATHER2 study, which is a two-year phase three, and this is the one that's looking at every other month compared to an every month uh, group. And, and, and interestingly, once you go from that 12 months to 24 months, we're seeing really, you know, much like the other study, right? We're seeing a doubling in the treatment effect of, of, uh, of, of geographic atrophy. Um, and this is every month versus every other month. So, so again, after the first year, being able to kind of back that off to every other month, we are really seeing 
almost a doubling in the treatment effects. All right. So this is the sham group. At, this isn't the sham. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm not sure what we're looking at. I think we're um, not sure what the difference is, but you're looking at baseline. I don't know if this is gather one or gather two, but point is you're looking at baseline compared to what you see baseline to 12 months and then and then uh, baseline to 24 months. And, and the point being, you're really seeing this acceleration in the treatment effect after that 12 month period. In fact, really a doubling of the treatment effect from one year to year two. And so that's really kind of the message, right? If we can get these patients past a year, we really start to see a, 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 a much better treatment effect from the drug. Now, uh, there's a few things that we're not gonna have a lot of time to talk about, but just keep in mind, this is an important point, right? Eyes that were treated, whether it was with the Apellus drug or the Iveric drug, there was a greater risk in the treated eyes of going on to develop wet or converting to wet AMD, about three or 4% in the sham group, about seven to 8% or even 9% in the eyes that had a treatment. So, so that is one thing to note that these eyes that are gonna be treated for geographic atrophy, the risk of converting to wet AMD may be a little bit higher. So let's talk a little bit about kind of some of the imaging modalities that we use to recognize and diagnose, right? And, and one of the things that I talked about from the beginning is I think GA is more common than we have ever realized. And part of it is we just really haven't been looking, right? We've looking at our kind of OCT scans and the question has been, have they converted? Do I see fluid? But yet you look at a couple of these patients, right? And this patient indeed has little focal patches of geographic atrophy. And, and maybe because there wasn't a treatment, right? Uh, there wasn't nothing we could do. So we really weren't focusing as much on that patient. Uh, and, and again, one of the issues, of course, if you're only using fundus photography is, is that sometimes it can be hard to recognize, right? You may have insufficient contrast. Some of these smaller lesions, like we look in this patient, may be missed. Here's a patient, large geographic atrophy. But again, sometimes you just don't have the contrast to really pick it up, even though I think nobody would, would miss this one. But that's really one of the limitations of just using color fundus photography is, again, sometimes you don't have the contrast, small lesions can easily get missed. And so again, I think most of us have OCTs. I think we can utilize our OCT and again, do a better job of recognizing and picking up geographic atrophy. And again, as I said, I think our, our focus has been over the last several years is really looking at these scans and and this is a case in point, right? Double layer sign in a patient who's got a little bit of elevation of the RPE. The question clinically, does that represent subretinal hemorrhage? And, and in fact, this patient has an occult coronal vascular membrane, even though there isn't fluid. Uh, and we don't see GA, but again, we really weren't looking for it back then. And so, so I think there's a couple things to, to recognize. I think you can look at, uh, at least on the Cirrus, this is the, the ONFOS image. And some of the other devices, you can look at the near infrared image, and you can pick up little areas of geographic atrophy. This one, of course, is is not subtle. You can recognize it. But the the important thing here is to look at this large transmission defect, right? Because you've got loss of the RPE. You know, picture this almost like a waterfall. You can see this transmission defect into the choroid, which is really pathognomonic for what you see as geographic atrophy. And again, you'd want to correlate it with what you saw with this on FOSH image. We're not going to get a chance to talk about biomarkers tonight. There's just not enough time, but that's uh, but but that's one of the things that when you start looking at your B scans, looking at some of these biomarkers that might be predicting prediction for, for progression. Here's a 79-year-old male who's got intermediate macular degeneration. And I've probably been following this patient for at least three or four years. He is great about coming in every six months like clockwork. Um, he's on an arid supplement. Um, and, and again, usually we don't do fundus photographs, uh, but this one was a case in point because, right, when I would see him, again, the focus was looking at these B scans, right? Does he have any fluid? Of course, you can see he's got some of the drusenoid changes. This is the left eye. Uh, and, and again, we'll kind of put you back to January 2023, almost exactly a year ago. I knew that we were gonna likely get an FDA approved treatment for geographic atrophy. So I'm looking at this patient and all of a sudden I'm looking at the left eye. I'm like, wait a minute, gosh, he's he's got some geographic atrophy there. And sure enough, when you look at one of the inferior roster lines here, right? He's got the transmission defect that we talked about. You don't see it here. You can kind of recognize it on the fauna on FOSS image, but on this inferior scan, 
clearly he's got a patch of geographic atrophy. And when I look back on some of these on FOSS images, uh, guess what, right? You can see it a year earlier, little small patch of GA. Here you are a year later. And guess what? I mean, he's he's getting bigger. And 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 again, I had not been looking. I had not been focusing. Uh, I've been really focusing on dry AMD. Has this patient converted? And um, and 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 gosh, all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a minute. Uh, and so, you know, he ended up actually. This was his last visit because he was moving to 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 Columbia, South Carolina, and I ended up recommending him to see Lloyd Clark in in Columbia. But we started talking about there is a treatment. I'm not sure if you're a candidate. If this progresses, again, it's another reason why we need to see you at least every six months. There was another uh, patient, perhaps maybe the first patient that was treated at Baskin Palmer. Again, almost the, the, the same example, right? This is a, a patient that I started following with cataracts. She's got obvious intermediate level AMD. I'm, I'm doing my OCT scans and I'm following her. And so here she is after having had cataract surgery. And, and again, 2025 in the right, 2030 in the left. And, and again, we won't get into biomarkers, but you know, you look at some of these changes, there's a hypertransmission defect. You've got what's called a hyperreflective foci on our B scan. So again, looking at things that might be predictors of progression, even just simple things as drews and height. So again, in, in September of 2022, that was not on my radar. It was not something I was looking for. I was looking for fluid. And so again, here she is, 2025, relatively happy. She comes in. So what, that was 2022 in September. A couple of months later, she's going, you know, I'm starting to have some distortion. Acuity was still good, but but again, she is starting to notice distortion. And so my question is, uh-oh, has she converted from dry to wet? And again, what you're starting to see is some collapse of these drusen, which is not a good sign. It is a marker that this is patient is going to progress. And again, you look at some of these biomarkers, there's some hypertransmission defects. And sure enough, right, let's fast forward to March. She's still 2030. She still has distortion. But guess what? You can see she's got in this right eye, she's developed some geographic atrophy. And so now, again, we're looking at the central scan. You're looking at a hypertransmission defect that shows up very nicely on our B scan. And, and again, just to compare, right, this was November to, to March, clear progression. And so once again, I and, and again, this is the color fundus photograph. I think you can see that. And then I did fundus autofluorescence. So I think we'd all recognize she's got a little island here, a little island here, and, and she is at risk of progression. So again, by now, we've got an FDA-approved treatment. I start talking to her about Listen, we've got a treatment. I don't know if this is going to progress. And, and so I did refer her to a retinal specialist. And I believe, again, I think she ended up having one of the first treatments at the time of Baskin Palmer. Depending on your OCT devices, again, there's other ways to monitor. This is uh, looking with the Cirrus, looking at kind of your, your sub-illumination uh, software that is a way of measuring really change in the geographic atrophy. So that's, again, a, an objective way of doing that. And that's kind of what I did with her. So it's, again, it's kind of cool having the technology to be able to show first the prior visit and what you're seeing now objectively being able to measure the size of, of the geographic atrophy. Um, again, not all ODs have uh, uh, fundus autofluorescence, but I will say that um, in all the clinical trials, this was the barometer for really uh, determining, do these drugs work? Are we able to measurably show less growth rate of geographic atrophy. So it's probably the best modality. Again, not all of us have it. For those who have wide field imaging, whether it's the Optos or the Claris or even the Iden, you may have that. And again, I would say in an AMD population, this becomes particularly the blue light, really a good marker for geographic atrophy. And again, we already showed the slide, just kind of reaffirming, right? That two and a half years to go on to develop central involvement in geographic atrophy in most clinical trials. And so this is a patient that I had not seen yet. She comes in 2011. And, and this is kind of the sad story of geographic atrophy, right? She's a 65-year-old, a active, perfect 2020 visual acuity, living a, ver a very active life. And you look, right? She's got some of these drusen that you see scattered throughout her posterior pole, really not affected, not bothered um, by macular degeneration whatsoever. We'll fast forward to 10 years. Uh, and, and, and again, these are not the best images using fundus photography, 
but this is what I let off, right? Here she is in June of 2021, um, and, and, and she's about 70, 75 now, and still very active. Um, she, she's walked, she walks every single day, she drives, she's leading, you know, the typical active senior productive life. And, and so I led with this story, right? And, and, and you know what is going to happen. We talked about the two, two and a half years that this will progress. And unfortunately, in June of 2021, we did not have a treatment. Again, I'll kind of look at more some of these fundus autofluorescent images. And so here she was when I saw her in February of last year, uh, led in by her daughter. Now she's 2200 visual acuity. Um, and, and, and this is the all too familiar patient that I think we've all kind of see and recognize, right? Um, and, and you can see she goes really from 21 to 23, lost central vision, um, and her life is completely changed. She's depressed. Uh, she's reliant on transportation. She's unable to read. She's unable to really enjoy her grandchildren. And, and this is the all too familiar story of, of geographic atrophy. Um, and so on one hand, I've got a patient I can offer a treatment for on, on, on this patient who I saw around the same time. Unfortunately, I don't believe she's a candidate for treatment. And so again, multimodal imaging is optimal. We've kind of looked at this a little bit, right? You look at this little island of geographic atrophy, some modeling. And, and in the right eye, despite 2030 acuity, this patient does have a little GA. And again, you look at the B scan, the question at the time was, has they converted? Clearly in the left eye, you can see this kind of hypertransmission defect, classic, um, classic for, for geographic atrophy. And, and you know, I, I actually, not in this deck, but I have the 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 lower roster line that really shows the area of, 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 of geographic atrophy there. So again, right? So yes, I, I would I would refer this patient. We know that this patient is at risk, maybe not in the right eye, but you can see this little patch of geographic atrophy. We looked at this one, right? 2025. Um, excellent visual acuity in, in both eyes, a lot going on. But guess what? You look in this left eye and you've got a little patch of, of geographic attribute there. So again, doesn't really show up, right? Wasn't really looking for it perhaps in December of 2021. The focus was conversion, even though, again, you look at some of these roster lines up here and clearly you can see that she's got patches of GA and is at risk of progression. Here she is a year later, still doing pretty well. Um, but again, GA was probably not the focus at the time. And, and again, you can, again, goes back to that 50 over 53%, right? That Aaron's talked about. This is her, right? This patient has several patches of geographic atrophy. And, and again, this is imaging with the Heidelberg. And I was just kind of looking at some of these line scans to be able to pick up. And so once again, you know, from, from the primary care perspective, while the patient still enjoys good acuity, I would refer this patient off to a retinal specialist um, you know, maybe not in the right eye, but I think, eh, you know, we could argue, right? Maybe not the left eye either, but certainly you want to watch it closely. Maybe you do want to get it because much like a glaucoma patient, this becomes really progression, right? Documenting the rate of progression and, and we know what the risk is in this patient. And so optimizing referral patterns, right? Early diagnosing, recognizing that GA is much more prevalent than we think, and the fact is, we just really, I don't think, have been looking for it. And I think over what this past year has taught, hopefully all of us, is we need to start looking for it, especially for those of us in the trenches and the primary care optometrists. You know, anytime you see an AMD patient, start looking for geographic atrophy. And again, whether it's OCT or if you have fundus autofluorescence, you know, establish a baseline, much like the glaucoma patient we just talked about, document that rate of progression, um, determine proximity to fovea. What is the risk of vision loss? And so again, the question is, you know, when do we refer? And I would say any GA that's threatening central vision, any GA that's beginning to involve the fovea, we've looked at a couple examples of this, large extra fovea lesions, you know, maybe not this one, you know, but certainly, you know, and, and maybe not this one either, you know, 2200, they've already got central GA involvement. Those would probably not be the ones that I would refer. And so kind of let's summarize this up where we are today with geographic capture, right? Two FDA approved treatments. Unfortunately, it does require a monthly or an every other month injection. Iserve may work a little more quickly, but again, as we kind of carry this on for the course of two to three years, I think maybe even Sifovri, what we're seeing may be a little bit better, but 
what are the issue is, or maybe a little bit more of an increased risk of intraocular inflammation.